I've given you three data sets, and as you can see, just by looking at the numbers, they're quite da different data sets to each other, right? But you've gone ahead, you've calculated all their means, now that I've fixed this one, and um, because each of them has the same number of scores, and each of them has the same sum overall, they all add up to 70, you get the same mean every single time. Um, seven and seven and seven. Now, it's not immediately obvious the first time you look at the numbers, before you start punching them into your calculator, that they're going to be this different. But let me show you a picture, which might help you understand what's going on. Here we go. Um, now, I, I know because of the colors, it's a bit funky, but hopefully you can squint a little bit. Um, and you can see in here, this is our first data set, which has like what, five up to nine, I think. Um, this is the one with lots of fours and lots of sort of tens, elevens. And then you've got this guy, which clearly has that outlier there. I think it's like 55 or something like that. Okay. Now, I know the red bars are all in different spots, the, my, my bar for the average, but they're really different spots because of the scale. They are all equal to seven. So, we're looking at measures of central tendency at the moment, and they don't tell the whole story. They don't tell the whole story, which is going to be our segue into what we're learning today. So let me get this out of the way. If you haven't already, where did I put it? There it is. If you haven't already, make this heading. I know it's got a bit of a, a gap in it. There we go. Um, mean was the first uh, measure of central, central tendency that we looked at. Mean. But we have two others, right? What are they? Median and median. Very good. So this is like the, the center of our, at the middle of our data. And then you've got the most common score, right? So mean, median, and mode, they're good, but they are not always sufficient to try and give you a sense of what is this group of people like? What is this um, set of scores like? What's this population? Can you give me an idea of its characteristics? The mean, the mode, the median, they'll give you, a, um, they'll give you some information, but they don't always tell the whole story. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to, let me get this out of the way. We're going to complement these with a couple of different measures, right? Actually, three. I'm going to tell you about two today, okay? Um, the measures we're going to look at are, and I hope you've heard of these before, so this will be a bit of revision. Um, range, which is the highest score, take away the lowest score. In fact, I'll even write that. The highest score, take away the lowest score. So it's just that difference. That's the range of the scores. And then secondly, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you what the second one is yet. We'll get to it in a minute. Now, range is what we call not a measure of central tendency, like where's the middle. Range is what we call a measure of spread. That's our heading. It tells you how spread out the data is. The bigger the range, the more spread out the data is. That makes sense. The more spread out the scores are. Range is great. If you have a think about the three sets of data I gave you in the beginning, you can look at them really quickly and work out what the highest score and the lowest score is for each one. What are the ranges for each set of scores? Can you tell me what's the range of the first set of scores? Do you need the numbers again? Do you want to see? <laughs> That's fine. Um, the numbers are... Here we go. We can actually just do them together, just by glancing at things. Here we go. Um, if you have a look at these numbers again, it looks like the smallest one is... Five and the biggest one is nine. nine. So that gives you a range of nine take away five, four. which is four. Okay, good. When you have a look at this one, again, you've got a lower score and a higher score. So the range here is nine. So I might just jot these down. We said four and nine. And what's this one? You go all the way from one up to 55. So you've got a range of 54. Okay. So these numbers, they clearly, at a glance, Unlike the mean, they tell you immediately that there's a difference between these, right? It doesn't tell us all the things, but it does give us a good idea, right? Now, what I want you to notice is the range is helpful. It gives us some useful information, but it has a problem. In fact, it has the same problem that the mean has. Because you remember when we talked about each of these, we talked about when you use them and when you don't use them. What was the problem that the mean had, which the median and the mode can fix? What, what sort of weakness did it have? Outliers. Yeah, very good. If you've got numbers that are kind of like outside the range of all your normal numbers, then they're going to throw out your mean, okay? And it's the same thing with the range, right? It's still, it's still susceptible. So this is worth writing down because sometimes you have to choose or justify why you choose this or that. It's still susceptible to outliers, 
the way the mean is, right? So we've solved one problem of the mean, which is that you always get, you, you can only get the one number. So it doesn't tell you the whole story. But these here, they're not perfect either, okay? So in addition to range, to try and get away from this outlier problem, we introduce something a little more specific <coughs> called the interquartile range. Who remembers this? Who's, yeah, ringing bells? Excellent, okay. So let me keep track of where I put this. So the interquartile range is very similar to this higher score take away lower score. But what it introduces is these quartiles, I'll talk about them in a second. It talks about rather than highest than lowest, it talks about an upper quartile, which is higher, as the name suggests. And it's still a difference. It's the upper quartile take away, anyone want to guess? The lower quartile, the lower quartile. very good. Yeah. They're trying not to make it too groundbreaking. Now, because it's a bit of a mouthful to say upper quartile and lower quartile all the time, we give these guys labels. They're quartiles, we call them Q3 and Q1. They go in order, ascending order. So the lower quartile is the first one you encounter, so it's Q1. Q2 is right in the middle of the data. We actually have a name for that already, and it's on the board. It's the median, right? Smack bang in the middle. And then as you keep on climbing up the data, you get to the third and final quartile. Okay. Now, why are they called quartiles? This is a really important concept, which um, we need to wrap our heads around because it'll be important tomorrow as well. The reason why they're called quartiles is because each of these scores, Q1, Q2, Q3, they divide up your population or your set of scores into sections. Now, do you remember what the median does? What, do you remember I gave you, you, we had like an informal, simple definition, and then I gave you like a longer, more awkward one. Do you remember what that was? Um, yeah, no, anyone? Any take it? Yeah, very good. So in other words, the median, it divides you into two equal halves, right? That's what the median does. You've got like, you know, four, uh, five scores down that way and five scores up that way. That's what Q2 does, okay? Therefore, the quartile row does is instead of dividing in you into two equal sections, because it's a quartile, it divides you up into four equal sections. Okay, so maybe you want to jot that down as your definition of what a quartile is. Um, it divides your scores into four equal sections. Okay. So for instance, if you knew what Q1, Q2, and Q3 were, and you're like, oh, I, my score, whatever I'm like, you know, or my height, or my weight, or my income, is above Q3, that means you know you're in the top 25% of the population, right? Or alternatively, you could say I'm in the bottom 25%, or whatever it might be, 